Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Tim Stewart. I'm president at Visual Decisions, and we're here today to talk about how to create a real-time value stream map with Industry 4.0. At Visual Decisions, we've been in the business of utilizing information from the shop floor to improve continuous improvement since about 2002. We help our customers combine the smart factory and the lean factory to drive improvements to cost, throughput, and quality. Our customers have seen dramatic improvements, such as 30% increases in OEE, 50% scrap reductions, and much more. Uh, just like wearing a Fitbit won't automatically make you thin, unfortunately, uh, implementing technology for Industry 4.0 won't automatically make the business better. The culture of the organization and the business processes have to be adapted to take advantage of new capabilities to drive real improvements. That's why we have a unique approach to work with our customers to adapt processes to take advantage of the new capabilities and help establish a true data-driven manufacturing culture. As a quick procedural note, uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A. I'll get to them at the end of the webinar. Thank you. So the goal for today is this. How can we make value stream mapping easier to perform, more accurate, more comprehensive, with more context, and also, uh, most importantly, an evergreen ongoing part of the daily management process? So to get started, we'll take a look at the traditional mapping process, and we'll also quickly review the typical mapping process output. So let's start with a basic question. Why do value stream mapping? Uh, the purpose of value stream mapping is to identify and remove or reduce waste in value streams, thereby increasing the efficiency of a given value stream. And waste removal is intended to increase the productivity by creating leaner operations, which in turn make waste and quality problems easier to identify. Value stream mapping accomplishes these goals by allowing the team to see the big picture of how materials and information flow through the manufacturing process. The visualization allows them to identify areas of waste, select priorities, and allocate resources to optimize the flow. In addition, the mapping process helps the team generate ideas on what the next future state of the process looks like, as well as the ideal future state. So next, uh, let's take a look at a uh, high level look at the overall mapping process. The process usually begins with a kickoff workshop. And in this workshop, we define the scope, what value stream will be the focus of the exercise. Is it for a single product, a product family or something else? Uh, do we need to do a product family analysis initially to figure out which products we can group together for analysis? Uh, the other typical steps in the kickoff workshop involve uh, determining who needs to be involved and creating the plan for how the exercise will be completed. Other steps at this point may include some initial charting, such as a brown paper chart that gives a very rough high level flow of materials through the manufacturing process. Uh, the next step in our typical mapping process is basic mapping. In this step, we create the basics of some of the fundamental mapping outputs, such as the actual value stream map, uh, the quality filter map, uh, spaghetti diagrams, et cetera. At this point, we may just outline our initial ideas of the flow, where the quality issues are happening, et cetera. Once we have the basics uh, completed, then we need to collect data about the current state to add to the maps. While this can be accomplished in several different ways, the traditional path is to get out to the floor and view the process. Uh, do your Gemba walks. Uh, this could mean talking to the operators and the supervisors to get their input on tack time and performance information, or it could mean monitoring the process and collecting actuals for a while to get the data. It's also a fairly common uh, step at this point to perform a manufacturing audit. Some examples of criteria for the audit uh, could be Schoenberger's uh, 16 Principles of World-Class Manufacturing or uh, Kobayashi's 20 Keys. So once the data has been collected, it's time for the current state workshop. 
This is where the team reassembles, kind of like the Avengers, uh, to add the data to the charts created back in the value stream mapping uh, step, or the basic mapping step, sorry. And um, at this point, the team will look at the completed visualizations to identify where that waste is within the process. And you know, at this point, the next step they may do would be uh, some detailed mapping. Uh, this could be done you know, either during the current state workshop with the entire team or the team may break into subgroups uh, to create the necessary analyses. And we'll have more details on the detailed mapping in the next slide. Uh, but once the overall analysis of the current state is completed, it's time for the future state workshop. And uh, during this workshop, uh, the team will gather again to go through the analysis of the current state, brainstorm ideas, uh, document the planned improvements, and create the action plan for improvement. Now, there are two possible future states the team uh, may produce here. Uh, there should always be a next future state map uh, where the immediate goals are documented. You know, what are the immediate improvements that we want to make? What is the immediate waste that we want to remove from the process? Optionally, the team may also produce an ideal future state map where all possible waste is removed. Either way, uh, the team should create a detailed project plan for executing the improvements to get to that uh, next future state. And uh, the final step, if I can be a nerd once again, is to make it so and implement the uh, proposed changes. So <clears throat> while the value stream map itself is a key part of the process, there are actually many outputs from a complete mapping project. And the list on this page is by no means comprehensive. Uh, it's simply a view of some of the most common outputs of the process. So here's a quick summary of the different things on uh, this page. And sorry for the small print, but there's a lot of them. So in that initial mapping section, uh, there's a product family analysis. And this analysis looks to group individual products into families based on identifying commonalities in their manufacturing processes. Uh, overall lead time mapping uh, can be viewed as a Gantt chart or a Pareto and looks to quantify the total lead time. And this can cover information flows, material flows, manufacturing, service, et cetera. Really anything that's considered to be part of the lead time for that individual product or product family. Uh, the brown paper overview, this is a really high level uh, flow chart of the overall flow within the factory. Uh, supply chain structure uh, is a high level analysis of the various suppliers in the process and what that supply chain uh, looks like. Uh, seeing the whole, uh, this is very similar to the value stream map within a plant, uh, but views the overall intercompany supply chain map instead. And I apologize, I moved to the supply chain block there. Um, entire plants will be represented as a single box within that flow. Uh, the demand amplification map, uh, if you're familiar with uh, like the beer game or you know, anything else that looks at how uh, amplification occurs from batching and inventory control processes in both the plant and the overall supply chain and leads to lumpy demand profiles uh, that resist level loading in the plant. Uh, the purpose of this map is to identify those amplifiers in the supply chain and see if anything can be done to mitigate those effects. And the cost time profile is a chart that shows accumulated cost against accumulated time. And uh, at this point, it's being done at the supply chain level and looking across different plants and so forth and suppliers to identify you know, where that cost is getting added at what time. Uh, moving on to the value stream section here. Uh, the value stream map itself is the traditional value stream map and pictured over on the left side there. It's meant to document how information and materials flow through the process to identify areas of non-value add activities and other wastes. Uh, the demand amp amplification map can be done at the plant level so that you're looking for where batching occurs within the facility and so forth. Uh, spaghetti diagram is a map of movement within the facility. 
And that's used to identify waste of transport and motion. Uh, this can be applied to the overall material movements, uh, but it can also be used to track the movements of people when performing tasks, uh, such as changeovers and setups and so forth. Uh, the quality filter map tracks the rates and sources of defects during the process. It's typically a high level map, but as we'll see later, it can be used to create a much more detailed view of quality when additional information is available uh, for drilling down. Um, activity sampling, uh, this is in, well, in this activity, an observer will randomly observe the process uh, periodically throughout a day or a week and observe how often the process is in a value add state versus a non-value add state and which way state it's in. And typically you want a number of observations here. Uh, a number that I've seen thrown around in different uh, implementations is about 200 uh, random observations. And the cost time profile can uh, once again be created at the plant level. And this is probably a more common use for it uh, within the plant so that you can see uh, as time goes on, once you release an order out to the floor, how does that cost stack up versus time? And it can be very useful for identifying, you know, where those costs are building up unnecessarily. Uh, in information processing, uh, we have order tracking and this tracks the information flow for an order and it tracks it across uh, really its entire life cycle. So planning, uh, generation, uh, cost estimation and pricing if that's part of the process, uh, order entry and uh, receipt, uh, order prioritization, scheduling, procurement, manufacturing, assembly, test, shipping, installation, billing, returns, service after the sale, et cetera. And so really tracking that entire life cycle and looking at uh, what is that cash-to-cash uh, -cash cycle essentially. Um, the information value stream map uh, is kind of that information flow up on top. Um, but you know that detailed view of that information flow, the isolated isolated view of that, looking from you know all the way on the supplier on the left side to the customer on the right side, how does information flow uh, for you know that entire process? And then process activity maps um, underneath detailed. Uh, these are the detailed maps for any areas of particular concern. The information is very similar to what you put on a value stream map. Uh, but it's captured in much more detail for that particular area. So that was a fairly quick overview of the typical traditional map and process and its outputs. As can be seen, it's a highly involved process that incorporates efforts from a lot of different people. And while it has tremendous value to the organization and is a critical part of any lean implementation, the traditional approach is also very wasteful. Uh, most of the data that's you know, gathered already exists and is available for use. So why go back out to the floor and gather the data manually? And we'll take a look at the pros and cons of each approach in this section. So why continue with the uh, traditional approach? And uh, these are things that I've heard from countless you know, lean professionals. Uh, continuous improvement people. And I, so what are the primary advantages? Uh, the first one that I've heard is uh, greater involvement from the people. And as people are going out to the floor, they're collecting this information, they're interacting with the process, they're having conversations with the operators and the supervisors across different shifts. Uh, you just get that much, much greater involvement of different people than if you know, all of this is just automatically generated on a computer screen. Um, kind of lasting ownership, and this goes along with some of that involvement piece, but you know, if somebody participates to that extent and they uh, have to you know, go through all this work and you know, effort and so forth, they're going to have a more lasting ownership of the result of that. And, you know, along with that, you know, an improved understanding of the process itself. So if the whole value stream app is generated automatically and, you know, everyone just goes into a conference room and they look at it on, you know, projected screen or whatever, 
um, you may not get that same level of understanding as if they're out on the floor collecting the data by hand, walking the process, talking to the people that are involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, and really uh, experiencing the process itself. Uh, you're better able to visualize the possibility. So again, if you're out there and you're seeing the process and you're walking it and you're you know, mapping everything out as you're doing that, and uh, you're, you know, maybe doing the, you know, sampling and so forth, where you're seeing if a process is in a value-add state, non-value-add state, et cetera. Um, you really start to, you know, visualize the possibilities here and see what can be done, what can be optimized, where can the waste be removed, and so forth. And finally, uh, investment in the change. And this kind of goes back to the involvement and the ownership and so forth. But someone that has put in all of this effort and uh, done all of this analysis and collected all of this data and so forth, will be much more invested in that next step, which is taking actions. Uh, you know, the example I use all the time for you know putting digital things in place is a Fitbit. Uh, I've been wearing a Fitbit for like seven years now, and I will admit that I haven't lost any real weight during that time. <laughs> and it's not that the Fitbit doesn't work; it works great tracks all my steps and shows me all the pretty charts and graphs and everything else but i haven't really changed my behaviors and um if you're not invested in making that change and making the commitment to change the behaviors then you're not going to remove the waste um quite literally in my case with the fitbit and so you know those are the typical reasons that i hear in terms of you know, why continue to, uh, you know, do this manually and so forth. So, you know, pretty strong argument. Um, what are the benefits of going digital and, you know, why look at this in the first place? Well, it's really around accuracy, uh, breadth, speed. You can shift the focus from collecting data to making improvements. And really it's turning this into something uh, that instead of hanging on a wall, you actually use it live in your daily processes. So uh, first of all, um, when you're doing the value stream uh, data collection manually, uh, the reason that you do that uh, demand family or product family analysis in the first place is that you have to narrow your focus. You cannot gather the information on everything at one time. And so you have to narrow that down. If you're doing this digitally and you're collecting or connecting to the data sources that are going to tell you this information, they're going to tell it to you for everything. And so basically, instead of uh, selecting a family for the analysis and then going out and collecting the data, you'll have all of the families there and you just select one to start this process with. Um, it's far more precise and accurate. And I can't emphasize this one enough. The data that's typically gathered by hand uh, is, first of all, biased. If you're standing there uh, next to the line and you're um, watching the process and you're collecting data, people simply behave differently. Uh, it's like when you're driving down the highway and you see a policeman on the side of the road, you slow down, um, or at least you know traffic does. And so people behave differently fundamentally when they know they're being watched. It's called the Hawthorne effect and it's been studied quite a bit in psychology. Um, so you're collecting biased data when you stand there watching the process. And if the data is just being collected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then it's unbiased because that's the way that it always happens. Um, it's also far more accurate and precise uh, because you're capturing everything and uh, you're capturing all of the different defects and so forth. You're capturing all of the different stops in the process. And so that's much more uh, comprehensive than it would be if you're just trying to do this manually. Um, it also reflects the true process. And as I said, it's unbiased, but uh, typically if you take a traditional approach, the guidance is just capture what's happening today and treat that as if that's what's normal uh, because if you ask people you know how the process is supposed to work they'll give you kind of an idealized version of it already 
And the idea is that you want to capture what is the actual waste that's happening. And again, when you're collecting that data 24 by seven, you see all of the waste. You see all of the things that go through rework cycles. You see you know, all the things that take a non-standard path through manufacturing because um, there's, you know, the machine is down or, you know, Joe isn't here today, so we have to run it over on this process instead, et cetera. And so you really see uh, what is the actual process that, you know, materials go through. And you also see all the process deviations uh, that take place on the shop floor on an ongoing basis. And you just don't see that when you go out there for a day or a week and you, you know, capture the data that's happening at that time. Um, it's also very important to show averages and distributions here. So instead of, you know, the traditional value stream map where I say that the cycle time is exactly 300 seconds, I'm saying that, you know, on average, the mean might be 300 seconds, but how fast can it be and how long can it take? And, you know, how often do we see those extremes? And this helps a lot because uh, part of what we're fighting against is not only what is the average waste in the process, but variability itself uh, causes a tremendous amount of waste. And so if we can identify that variability by understanding how much there is in the process, that helps us to you know, target those things. Um, one of the biggest parts of this is that when you do the value stream mapping process in the traditional manner, you do it as a project. You gather you know, a team together and you have this kickoff and you go through those steps I talked about earlier, and then you're done. And the value stream map is there. You have your current state, you have your future state map, and they're the same tomorrow as they are today. They're the same a month from now as they are today because it was a project and you did the project and you're done. With a digital view of this, it's an ongoing thing. So as the process evolves, as you make changes, as, it, as entropy occurs and so forth, the value stream map will automatically update because it's connected to those sources that are collecting information from the shop floor 24 by seven. And because it's automatically updating, now you have the capability of saying, we, our current state was this, now it's this, and we can, can actually compare those two to see how is the process evolving over time. As we make changes, we can actually record that we're you know, making a change in the process now, and we can measure the impact of that. Did we get to our desired future state after we implemented that change? Um, it can be part of the daily process. So, if you uh, have this value stream map and you understand how it's supposed to work, what the times are supposed to be and so forth, how much non-value at time you're supposed to have between operations as a maximum, hopefully, uh, as you see deviations to that process, you can actually notify people. You can have alerts in the process and so forth that go out and notify uh, supervisors, you know, production engineers, et cetera, that, hey, this is only supposed to take you know, two hours uh, for cool down between these two steps. We're at six hours now, what's going on? Um, and then you can focus, the, or you can shift the focus from collecting data to how are we actually going to analyze and improve the process? And that's where you can maintain that ownership in what's going on here, is you still take the time to analyze all of this. You, uh, still have the people involved. You still bring in, you know, all of the different people. Uh, you still go out to the shop floor and you validate this information that you're collecting from uh, these systems against what you actually see out on the shop floor. And you still have those same conversations, but you're shifting the focus away from collecting the data to, well, first of all, validating the data, but then, you know, what can we actually do to make the process better? And there's only a certain amount of time in the day. And if you're spending 20 of those 24 hours just getting the data in the first place, you only have four hours left to you know, decide what to do with it. If the data is already there and you validated it after the first couple of hours, you've still got quite a bit of time left in that day to actually decide how are we going to make the process better? So you don't necessarily 
spend less time on this. You don't necessarily, you know, I uh, just rush through the process because, hey, we already have, you know, the data the systems doing it. No, you still take the time, but you shift that focus to utilizing the information. All right, with all that said, how do we actually go digital? So data actually originates at every step in the value chain. And uh, this is an example uh, that we looked at with a bakery company where we you know, looked at everything coming in from uh, receiving an inspection all the way out to uh, the warehouse and transportation out to uh, the different stores. And at every step along the process, they were collecting information. Uh, there were PLCs uh, that you know, collected you know, detailed information about every single step in the process. Uh, there were work orders that were tracked in you know, the ERP and MES systems. There was a lot of data out there. And so rather than, you know, going out and just observing the process, we were able to take this existing information and map that into, uh, you know, these different uh, analyses that we looked at earlier. So what are some places that you can get this information? At a high level, uh, you can look at, you know, for instance, routings uh, from your ERP system. You can look at, you know, uh, inventory and how it changes states and so forth. You can look at your MES system and you can basically track uh, work orders through your MES uh, history and see you know, how long they spent at a given process, when they arrived at the next process, how long they took to process there and so forth. Uh, you can look at your planning systems and see what is the information and so forth that you're passing out to your suppliers. What are you getting from your customers? How are you uh, actually uh, prioritizing and planning those orders. Uh, you can look at your supply chain system and actually track your actual, uh, you know, purchase requests out to your suppliers and so forth. Uh, you can look at your uh, industrial Internet of Things system, which can give you extremely detailed information about uh, what's happening within each individual process. Uh, you can tie that into an RFID system where uh, instead of generating a spaghetti map manually, you just have it track the RFID chip through the factory and you can see all of the movements that are taking place over time. Um, and not just that one time that you looked at the spaghetti map, but all the time. Um, you can look at uh, time systems like Kronos that you know, help track the labor and where the labor is at given times and so forth. And so there are many, many different kind of high level sources for you know, this information that goes into a traditional value stream map. Um, you know, from a uh, quality perspective, uh, you know, looking at uh, like the quality filter diagram and so forth. Um, ah, excuse me. Uh, you can uh, do this manually. You know, you can take a random sample of, you know, a day or a week or whatever and, you know, track all this information manually. And I apologize, I forgot to take the transition off of here. Uh, but essentially, all of these different systems are quality systems and uh, have quality information within them. And I'm just going to uh, leave it here. Uh, all of those different systems, we did a, an example with a uh, geez, firearms manufacturer and within that firearms manufacturer, uh, we were asked to create a quality dashboard, a corporate quality dashboard across seven different facilities. And within those seven different facilities, they actually had 57 different systems that had quality information within them. And so uh, by taking that information, by uh, utilizing uh, systems to uh, you know, make that, uh, more robust uh, and uh, you know consolidated, we were able to uh, create that single dashboard that looked at quality across those different plants, across those different systems, and really consolidated that information so that as people were trying to analyze that process, they would have the context there from you know the different places, but be able to see the summary and then drill down into that information to get to the more detail. Uh, let me do something real quick.
slideshow uh, transitions. No, animate, not transitions. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, do it on mouse click and apply to all. Okay. Sorry about that. So the next step is, you know, kind of what information are we capturing? And one of the keys here is that you can't just collect the performance information. If I just look at my first pass yield, uh, that doesn't tell me all of the information I need to actually improve the process. What I have to understand is what are the diagnostic metrics? What are the actual reasons why things are happening? So if I look at the different defect modes, um, I can you know, have something that's a dimensional defect, a functional defect, cosmetic, and then you know, the different uh, individual defects within there. And uh, if I capture information at that level, it will help me to not only identify you know, where uh, I have quality issues, but also what those quality issues are and what I need to do to improve them. And so there's a couple of different ways to organize that information. One is to do it on a traditional uh, fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. And then there are a number of other ways to you know, classify uh, those uh, failures and so forth. But the key is that you want to have that structure there as you're capturing the information from the process. And uh, that way you have it available for the analysis that you want to do later. So the next step here is, you know, how do we actually show the maps? And uh, what are the systems that we use to actually do that? And so, you know, as I talked about in the example of the firearms manufacturer, uh, they had raw information in 57 different systems. So how do we actually build up the reports that we want to see you know, from all of those different source systems? And there's several different options here. Uh, one is that we can utilize a purpose-built uh, system. And in that purpose-built system, it's made specifically for you know, lean manufacturing analysis. And there are a number of packages out there. And today I don't want to get into you know, which packages are better than which and you know, which approach here is uh, superior and so forth. Um, this is more of an agnostic view of it, uh, but there are purpose-built systems out there. And you know, the key as you're looking into any of those is um, how easy is it to feed the information into those systems? And so uh, they're already built for lean analysis and so forth, and they have many of these uh, maps and reports built into them. The key is just how do we get the information in? If it's a manual process of putting that information into it, then it's probably still not the direction that you wanna go. Um, business intelligence systems is actually what we used at that firearms manufacturer. Uh, things like uh, Power BI or Tableau or Click or you know, any number of other solutions that are out there. Uh, are very, very good at uh, taking fragmented information across disparate different systems, consolidating that information together, and then providing cohesive views of that data. Uh, it's what they were built for. And so uh, if you have the data in those source systems already, uh, the business intelligence system, uh, you can reasonably quickly create those reports or you know, we have you know, examples of those reports that uh, we can utilize uh, to use as a template to move forward with. Um, IIoT platforms basically act as a hub on your manufacturing floor uh, to collect very detailed information uh, from the process itself, as well as uh, connecting to you know, other uh, data sources. And so just like the business intelligence system can uh, be a hub where you pull information from source systems. Uh, the IIoT system can do that as well, but it can also be a source system itself. And then there's uh, the custom software approach where you basically build everything from scratch. And um, you know there are customers that we've worked with that have you know tremendous capabilities within their IT departments where they had already built a number of different pieces of this where it made sense to just continue that custom development in-house and you know, build up the rest of this analysis uh, capability. 
Um, so those are different approaches that you can take. Uh, the ones that um, we have done most often with our customers are probably the BI approach and the IIoT platforms. So uh, some closing thoughts here. How do we really combine the benefits of the manual approach with the digital? Um, and you know, really, how do you maintain the fingerprints on the process? Uh, that's a phrase uh, from David Mann's book on creating lean culture, where he talks about uh, visual controls, uh, subject that I talked about in my webinar last week, and uh, being able to maintain that ownership and so forth as represented by people having their fingerprints you know, on the process and on the data. And uh, these are the five different uh, advantages of the manual approach that I talked about earlier. And I'll address kind of each one of those in a digital context. And so from an involvement point of view, uh, you don't have to have people become less involved. The involvement simply shifts the focus. So instead of doing the grunt work of collecting the data, uh, people can focus on the process improvement. Again, you don't have to collapse the time that this is taking, although you can. Uh, you can really just have the time that people are spending uh, really better understanding the process, you know, where the waste is and, you know, how to actually make the improvements uh, instead of doing the grunt work of data collection. Um, Lasting ownership, I actually think that this one is really tilted towards uh, the digital uh, because instead of hanging on the wall, uh, digital value stream map becomes a part of that daily process. Uh, by embedding the value stream map into the leader standard work, by setting up alerts around you know, process deviations and utilizing this as a live uh, system, uh, that ownership is really ongoing. Um, improved understanding, Again, you know, people can still go to the floor even when the data is automatically collected. Uh, you know, they're, they're not barred from the shop floor. And so the greater depth and breadth and accuracy of the data gives a much deeper understanding really than just going out and watching the process because now you can have both. You can go out and watch the process and see how it's working and follow it step by step. But you can also have all of that information available to you uh, to give you that deeper understanding of the process. Um, visualizing the possibilities and you know, everything that's done in the traditional uh, future state workshop can still be done. You can still use sticky notes and put them on the wall if you want to, to represent the process and then you know, remove sticky uh, notes and rearrange them and everything else. Um, if you wanna do that, you still can. Um, there's nothing that stops you from that. But when you put those sticky notes up there to represent the current state of the process, you'll have the data behind it so that it actually represents the current state of the process. Um, and then also, you know, as you're visualizing possibilities, that more comprehensive data can highlight many more opportunities than you would otherwise see if you're just looking at a snapshot of, you know, one point in time. As far as investment and change goes, the traditional idea is that that additional work of you know, collecting the data makes people more invested. And again, the idea here is that you're not really eliminating that. You're just shifting that focus from the grunt work to the outcome. And I, you know, the fact that their focus is on the outcome, I believe actually helps make them more invested in those improvements that they're taking more time on uh, to generate. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you. I do have one question. Uh, how would 5G implementation improve uh, the value stream uh, data and updating? Uh, so the 5G implementation uh, really just helps you collect more data faster. And so if you have, uh, for instance, IoT devices out on the shop floor, uh, having a 5G implementation within your facility uh, provides a backbone uh, to get that data on, you know, a more frequent sampling and uh, really utilize that in your analysis. And so uh, the 5G implementation uh, just provides that infrastructure and allows you to collect additional data.
Um, any other questions for today? Um, if not, um, that concludes today's webinar. I wanna thank everyone for attending and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'll follow up with each of you through email, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me by phone or email at any time. I'd love to talk to you to find out about how you're currently performing, uh, you know, your uh, value stream mapping and so forth, and where you stand on your, uh, both your industry 4.0 journey as well as your lean journey and how we might be able to help. Uh, thank you again. Bye-bye.